This is a Dell Latitude E7240. I purchased this from a secondhand website. It's described as not powering on, and I confirmed with the seller that when he presses the power button, nothing at all happens. Now, I don't have a battery with this. I also don't have a charger. The regular Dell charger doesn't work with this. This is a little older than I would normally deal with. This is a fourth generation processor. And the coax connection on this power adapter is slightly bigger than the Norman Dell. So I'm gonna take out the board, I'm gonna scan it into the screen, and we're gonna take a look at this together. And this is the board from that laptop. When I took out the million screws to release it, you sort of forget how spoiled we are nowadays with the new laptops, how easy it is to get out the motherboard. This took me quite a while to get out of the chassis. Now since I don't have the original power adapter with this, I'm going to use my DC power supply to bring power to the board and see if we can get the power on. So let me show you how I set that up. Now as we zoom in we can see our DC connector right here. So there's five pins on this. We've got a little notch here to mark pin one, one, two, three, four, and five. So how do we know which of these we need to inject our positive DC voltage? Well if we zoom in a little bit more you can see that these two pins here are joined together and it appears to follow a track underneath the connector and onto this inductor PL4. Let me mark that in. Okay. And then from there, it goes through and off to somewhere else on the board. So I think that this is where we should be injecting our positive DC. I've confirmed on the schematic that pins 2 and 3 are in fact where our positive DC input voltage connects to. So let me show you how I injected power. First of all, I introduce my DC power supply. I then connect my black wire to ground. I connect my red wire to that inductor. It's easier to solder to that inductor than it is to these pins right here. And I always try and do this safely. So with those connected, I turn on my power supply and I inject 19.50 volts. That's what the adapter normally provides. And when I connected this up, the laptop immediately started drawing 11 milliamps. And 11 milliamps is a similar current draw to other working laptops that we've seen when they are plugged in but not yet powered on. So let's follow that 19.5 volts and see how much of this motherboard is working. Well, where we're injecting our 19.5 volts goes from pin 2 and 3 onto PL4 and if we zoom in, it's not immediately obvious where it goes next. So let's have a look at the schematic and see if we can find out. I've drawn up a partial simplified schematic for this motherboard, so we're going to follow along on this. Now we're injecting our 19.5 volts in here at PL4, and after PL4, on another part of the motherboard, it connects onto the source pins of PQ4. So let's try and find PQ4. And I've found PQ4. So this is an Aeon 7401P channel MOSFET. Let's mark in the pins. So as you saw in the graphic earlier, I'm injecting 19.5 volts at that input inductor PL4. Now that voltage should be coming through onto the source pins of this MOSFET. So that's the first thing I'm going to verify with my multimeter. Introducing my multimeter in volts DC in a 20 volt range, I place my black probe to ground and place my red probe to the source pins of this MOSFET. And when I place it to the source pin, I find that it measures 19.50 volts. So our 19.5 volts that I'm injecting at PL4 is making it true to the source pins of our first MOSFET, PQ4. The gate pin of PQ4 controls whether this MOSFET is switched on or not. So let's take a measurement at this gate pin right here. So placing my black probe to ground again and my red probe to my gate pin, I find that it measures 6.20 volts. So this is a low signal and that MOSFET should be switched on. So we've established that PQ4 is getting the correct gate signal. If this MOSFET is working, it should now be switched on and we should be measuring 19.5 volts on the drain pins also. And measuring very carefully with my red probe, I can confirm that there is 19.5 volts on the drain pins of our first MOSFET. I've marked in in red lines where our voltage has come so far, and I think it might also be useful to mark in the voltages that we've measured. So what you can see here is that we've got 19.5 volts that comes in from our inductor onto the source pins. We've measured our gate pin as being 6.2 volts. That switches this MOSFET on and that is allowing our 19.5 volts through onto the drain pins of PQ4. 
So following our 19.5 volts true PQ4, the next component in line is this MOSFET here, which is marked as PQ700. Now if I mark in the pins, you will see that this is also a P-channel MOSFET, so it should operate similarly to PQ4. Measuring at the gate pin of PQ700, we find a voltage of 0.1 volts. Now 0.1 volts on that gate is certainly a low signal, but I'm just not sure if it's indicative of there being no voltage going to at all, or if that actually is the correct signal. But we'll know if the MOSFET is switching on by measuring the source pins. And measuring at the source pins of PQ700, I confirm that there is 19.5 volts. So we're good up to this point. And this is an overview of the voltages that I've measured, just in case you want to compare it to your own. The 19.5 volts power rail is certainly present and looks okay to me. From this, it goes down to an NVDC battery management IC, where a lower voltage is generated and sent out to all of the secondary circuits. So let's see if we can locate that battery management IC. So back to my simplified schematic once again. We have followed our 19.5 volts through our inductor, through these two MOSFETs and onto the current sense resistor. So we're good up to this point here. These two MOSFETs, PQ704 and PQ706, are used to regulate our 19.5 volts down to our VSYS voltage, which is then sent down to all of our secondary circuits. The gate pins of these two are controlled by our battery management IC. So our H drive pin controls the gate pin of PQ704, the high side MOSFET, and our low drive, pin 15, controls the gate pin of PQ706. To confirm that these MOSFETs are giving us the correct VSYS output voltage, we can check at the center point right here. And since pin 19, the phase pin of this battery management IC, is also connected to the center point between these two MOSFETs, it's also possible to check for that VSYS voltage at pin 19 of the battery management IC. So let's check and see if our VSYS voltage is present. On the other side of the board, I've located PQ704 and PQ706, these two MOSFETs. And right beside it is PU700, which is our battery management IC. So I'm going to zoom in, and I've marked in the pinouts just to make it easier for us to follow along. As you can see, they are quite small. So as you can see, we have pin 19 for phase here, and as we established earlier on, this is where we can measure the VSYS voltage that is sent down to all of the secondary circuits. So with my multimeter in volts DC in the 20 volt range, once again, I place my black probe to ground, and I place my red probe to pin 19, and I find that it measures 13.50 volts. So our VSYS is 13.50. I think this is good, because we had a Dell a couple of weeks ago, that had a similar NVDC configuration and it also had 19.5 volts in and 13.5 volts out as the VSYS voltage. Back to our simplified schematic and I've written in that we have confirmed that we have 13.50 volts on our main VSYS power rail. Now this VSYS power rail goes down to all of our secondary circuits. So the next thing I need to establish is, is it going down to the IC that produces our 3.3 .3 volts LDO and our 5 volts LDO? So let's locate that IC. The IC that is responsible for producing the 3.3 .3 volts LDO and the 5 volts LDO is PU100. So PU100 takes our 13.50 volts on its input pin and if it's working it's then meant to produce our VREG3 output and our VREG5 output and they are marked in as follows. So let's locate this IC on the motherboard and see if we can measure those voltages. I've located PU100, which is a TPS51285, and I've marked in the pinouts on that IC. I think I'll need to zoom in further, actually, so we can see. So as you can see here, we have pin 12, which is where our VIN comes in. We have pin 13, where we expect to find our VREG5. And we have pin 03, where we expect to find our VREG3. So let's take some measurements around this and see if those voltages are present. So let's measure the input voltage first. With my black probe on ground, my multimeter in volts DC in the 20 volt range, I place my red probe to pin 12, and I find that it measures 13.50 volts. So we're getting the correct input. At pin 13, 
V-Reg 5, I'm measuring 5.04 volts. So our always on 5 volts is also present. At pin 3, V-Reg 3, I'm measuring 3.30 volts. So our always on 3.3 .3 volts is also present. There are two enabled pins on this IC. Pin 20 is enabled 1 and pin 6 is enabled 2. Now I measure these and these are both 3.1 volts which means that this IC should be fully enabled and giving us both our V-Reg voltages and our switched outputs. So I decided to check the switched outputs and see if they were present also. At pin 18, our first switched output, I measured 5.04 volts. And at pin 8, our second switched output, I measured 3.30 volts. It's interesting to see on this laptop because we've had this question before as to whether both the VREG slash LDO voltages and the switched outputs should be present even though the laptop isn't powered on. Well this IC is certainly producing both our LDO voltages and our switched outputs even though the laptop isn't fully powered on. But seeing how our voltage rails all look good here I'm just going to try and power on this laptop and see what happens. Okay so this is our motherboard. I have my jumper wires bringing my 19.5 volts onto the board and I have inserted a DDR3L RAM that I know is good. So let's try and press the power button here. This is the power button, I'm pressing it now. Okay, so. Okay, so it's coming on and going off immediately by the look of it. One more time. Okay. I went looking for the BIOS IC just to make sure that it was getting the correct input voltage. And it was only at that point that I noticed this. I had seen the little scratch on it earlier, but I thought it was peripheral until I zoomed in a little closer. Can you see what's happening? Well, as you can see, it seems like one of the tracks, at least, has been lifted up off the motherboard right here. And that makes me think that somebody tried to take off the BIOS IC to program it and did all of this damage to it. I'm not sure whether there should be a second IC in position number two. Now, I was worried that maybe I had pulled it off when I was pulling off the stickers somehow, but I checked online. And if you look online for that same motherboard, you can see the following images of that same motherboard. So the sticker appears to leave easy access to the BIOS IC. And that second IC doesn't seem to be on most of the motherboards. So I think what happened was somebody tried to take off this BIOS IC, uh, broke off one of the tracks, and they never replaced the BIOS IC, obviously. So the reason the laptop is coming on and shutting down is because there is no BIOS IC on this motherboard. So we really have three issues to resolve with this laptop. First of all, I need to buy a replacement BIOS IC. Second of all, I need to get a program for it, which hopefully should be available from badcaps.net or somewhere like that. And thirdly, I need to fix that track that looks like it's broken. And that is what I'm going to do in a follow-up video. So that concludes my video for this week. I cannot do any more without getting that replacement bias I see. Please like and subscribe. And if you have any comments about this video, please put them down below. Or you can contact me directly on the repairshare at gmail.com.